Farming is the number one source of employment in Africa, yet its agricultural productivity is the lowest of any region in the world. This is harming rural communities which have a lack of economic opportunity, and climate change is making things even worse. Climate change is increasingly posing a challenge to agriculture developments in Africa. So young Africans are building innovative solutions to tackle the problems that are impacting their families and communities, using technology to turn the Sahara green. The oasis for me, masterpieces of survival. Domestically manufacturing organic fertilizers. We are aiming to increase farm productivity. And building critical infrastructure to ensure harvests make it to the market. We have been able to reduce that post-harvest losses from an average of 40% to less than 1%. Africa is home to 60% of the world's uncultivated farmland. Its farming potential is immense. With the right investments in technology, infrastructure, and sustainable practices, could Africa feed the world? Here is an oasis, a rare patch of life in the harsh desert. These can form when water rises to the surface from underground springs or rivers, creating pockets of fertility in otherwise barren landscapes. But they can also be shaped by human hands, by using ingenuity to turn dry soil into thriving ecosystems. It's an ancient practice, and one that's increasingly under threat. In the Gulmim region, I remember not a long time ago that it was a, once a vibrant agricultural region or hub. Today, we found ourselves with lots of issues. Climate change, poor land management, and overexploitation push deserts to spread shrink oases, and transform fertile soil into wastelands. Those pressures have really changed and reshaped not only the land, but also the communities that depend on it. It's a staggering reality. We lose about 13 million hectares of productive arable land every year. It's an area the size of the country of Greece. Meet Wissal Ben Musa, co-founder and R&D officer at Sand to Green a startup transforming deserts into sustainable farmland in Morocco. We're here at uh, Domaine Zaha. It's a 20 hectare open sky laboratory. If you look around, it's one of the only green areas in, in the region throughout the year. And for us, it's always a powerful example to show that with the right practices, it's possible. By combining traditional farming techniques with cutting edge technology, Santa Green transforms how agriculture is done. Using plant databases, satellite imagery, and IoT sensors, they monitor soil, water, and crop health in real time. Our focus is on restoring soil health, creating biodiversity by using practices like agroforestry, planting around the trees, crop rotation, cover cropping, holistic grazing. These are key practices of regenerative agriculture, a farming approach that orchestrates activities in harmony with nature to ensure healthier land, more food, and sustainable future for farming. One of our most straightforward design deployed is the use of agroforestry system with the different trees shrubs and crop with the agricultural layering. By implementing this system, tall trees act as a canopy, reducing evaporation, shielding the crops below from wind, and enriching the soil with nutrients. But none of this will work without one crucial element, water. We are in an arid area and the water is scarce. One of our flagship projects is using a renewable groundwater that needs desalination. Desalination removes salt and minerals from brackish or seawater, transforming it into fresh water suitable for agriculture and more. With solar-powered desalination units, Santa Green harnesses this process to create renewable fresh water. It's cliche, but I have a dream of a, a green desert, or at least green zones with stable ecosystem where new techniques complete the ancestral know-how and try to build a blueprint for restoring arid lands. However, creating arable land is just one part of the challenge. Farming productivity in Africa remains low, partly due to limited access to affordable fertilizers. Centralized production means fertilizers are expensive to transport to rural areas, burdening small-scale farmers with high costs and low yields. Safi Organics is a company working to break this cycle. From data, it has been shown that in Africa, we are paying two to five times the world fertilizer prices. 
Meet Samuel Rigu, co-founder and CEO of Safi Organics, on a mission to boost farming productivity in his home country of Kenya and across Africa. The governments in Africa are doing subsidy programs, but the subsidy is still never enough. Our purchasing power is relatively low. Hence, they can only afford the cheapest of these fertilizers. These cheap fertilizers make the soils acidified. And once the pH has gone low, the productivity now goes low. So at the end of the day, Safi Organics we are looking at manufacturing locker to cut down the logistical costs, ensuring that the farmers are able to get the fertilizer at a more affordable Price. In terms of the impact to the farmers we are working with, we have seen an increase in yield of up to 30%. This is what Safi Organics calls the decentralized model, where production factories are set up right in the heart of farming communities to create a complete loop of the value chain. We start from when the farmer has produced the farm waste. We have youth groups who we empower to supply us with the raw material. We take them through a training process on the conversion of the farm waste into biochar. Biochar is produced by heating organic waste in a low oxygen environment, preventing full combustion and creating a porous, stable form of carbon. It serves as a soil amendment while also returning carbon to the ground, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Once we have it here, we do the mixing with the special nutrient mixes to form the different product to fit the local soils. For example, here in Kerinyaga, the soils are highly acidified. In a place like Kisumu, the soil there are alkaline. Now, if you look at the synthetic fertilizers, they are a one-fit-all kind of product. But for us, we are able to produce a slightly alkaline or a slightly acidified fertilizer. This decentralized approach works well for a small region, but to keep costs low across different areas, it must be scaled and replicated. One of the things that we are doing right now is showing Kenya as an example that this is a replicable model. We can replicate this model starting from East Africa and then across uh, Africa. Creating the right on-farm conditions to grow crops is an important part of the journey. Ensuring they reach markets efficiently is another challenge. Even with higher farm productivity, post-harvest loss remains a significant issue. It is estimated that as much as 37% of food produced in Sub-Saharan Africa was lost between production and consumption, often due to inadequate storage and transportation infrastructure. According to data from AgBase, an initiative powered by Brighter Bridges and Mercy Corps Agrifin, off-farm funding for businesses that tackle issues like post-harvest loss only accounts for one-third of total agriculture funding in Africa, and that share is reducing year over year. Keep It Cool is a company in Kenya looking to combat this issue by improving the cold chain and transportation networks to ensure that harvests reach the market without spoiling. Meet Francis Nduritu, founder of Keep It Cool. We provide proximate cooling services to fish farmers as well as poultry farmers to help them reduce post-harvest losses and be more climate resilient. For example, Lake Trukana, Kenya, whose service losses are very high, up to 40%, because of very high ambient temperatures, up to 40 degrees, coupled with poor handling techniques. And this is where Keep It Cools comes in. We train the fisher folk on how to handle the fish better. We have a solar-powered ice flake machine that are producing ice and servicing these fishing communities so that they can keep the fish at the right temperature. The way we work as Keep It Cool, we start from the demand side, where we are able to have predictive data using technology. We aggregate all their demand, and we will go to the fisher folk or communities and say this is what we'll be of taking every week or every month, so that once they go fishing, they know that there is ready market for their produce that they're going to have. We have to create a lot of demand, depending now on the customer needs. For example, we'll do gutting and scaling for the people who want whole round fish, we'll do chunking, filleting, and it's packaged according to the order of the customer. By doing that, we have unlocked premium prices for smallholder fisher folk, and that's how we have been able to increase their income. Before Keep It Cool, the post service losses on average were about 27% uh, for all fisher folks, and those people who are now using Keep It Cool platform, they are making less than 1% uh, post service losses. While keeping produce fresh from source to market is one problem, sustaining a productive supply, especially amidst climate change, is another. The way fishing is affected by climate change is the change of temperatures affects migration patterns. And with, again, this erratic change of weather, the fish where you predicted the part of the area of the lake for them to be, 
they are not there. These erratic weather patterns basically means their income is also destabilized. And that translates also to another way that we need to make them more climate resilient by providing a secondary way to make income. And that's why we are transitioning some of them into fish farming, into poultry farming, using the same existing infrastructure of Keep It Cool that we have around that, those communities. Africa's agriculture sector holds immense opportunity. To fully realize this potential, significant investment in technology and infrastructure is needed, blending traditional practices with cutting edge innovation. And it's the entrepreneurs driven by a desire to solve challenges for their families and communities who are pushing progress forward. I was born in a rural village and one afternoon with my grandmother in the field, she said words I'll never forget. Son, 20 years back, we were harvesting double of what we harvested today. And I'm afraid that in future, there'll be no food in this land to feed your children. So you need to go to school, study hard, and get out of the farm. But as I grew, I realized that I'm not the only one who depends on their agriculture, all my children, but million other children. We are hit in the face by climate change. It's touching so many people around me. I hear stories from neighbors, I hear stories around villages. I go to picnic spaces that I used to run into and even swim sometimes and I don't find them anymore. And that is happening in the span of 10, 15 years. It's not about searching for a better place, it's about just trying to better up the place where you are. And I don't think we should be losing hope in a space where we have people living. So I just thought that I have the obligation to give back. Thanks for watching this episode of The Green Print, the flip series on climate action and economic development across Africa. For more episodes like this, please hit that subscribe button. This episode was produced in partnership with Catalyst Fund, Delta 40, Africa Climate Ventures, and AgBase, an initiative powered by Brighter Bridges and Mercy Corps Agrofin. If you want to learn more, we've added some resources and links in our description as well.